Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. We begin tonight in Mississippi, specifically in Jackson, Mississippi, the state's largest city and also the state's capital. And even more specifically, let's go to a place a couple of miles away from the Capitol building, the Jackson Women's Health Organization. That's the clinic also known as the Pink House. And it's the only abortion clinic in the entire state of Mississippi, a state with ne nearly 3 million people. And it only has one abortion clinic. And there it is. Over the weekend, Jackson was one of several cities across the country to hold a women's march with a few dozen people out in the streets protesting for women's equality and the right to choose. And if anyone knows what a world would look like without easy access and readily available access to abortion, it would be the people in the state with only one abortion clinic for three million people. That's probably why activists in Mississippi have been some of the loudest when it comes to abortion access. And in just under two months, a legal battle that started in Mississippi could mean the end of Roe v. Wade as we know it. The Supreme Court's new term began today. The term includes a case about Mississippi's abortion law, which essentially bans all abortions after 15 weeks. And as a reminder, the nation's highest court has consistently reaffirmed Roe v. Wade or, quote, a woman's right to choose an abortion before viability, which, according to science, is typically around 24 weeks of pregnancy. It's also an important thing that we don't forget the groups of women that will be hit the hardest by any change to that precedent. The majority of women who have abortions are women who already have children. And Latinx and black women make up the majority of women who get abortions. So as the Supreme Court gets ready to hear this case, we also can't forget that the court has a much different makeup than it has had in the past for any of those abortion cases they heard back then. There is now a six to three conservative majority. And three of those conservative justices were appointed by President Donald Trump. Even before President Trump was in the White House, he made it very clear how he felt about the Supreme Court and about Roe. Do you want the court, including the justices that you will name, to overturn Roe v. Wade, which includes, in fact states, a woman's right to abortion? Well, if that would happen, because I am pro-life and I will be appointing pro-life judges, I would think that that will go back to the individual states. But I'm asking you specifically, would you if like to... If they overturned it, it'll go back to the states. But what I'm asking you, sir, is... Do you want to see the court overturn? You just said you want to see the court protect the Second Amendment. Do you want to see the court overturn Roe v. Well, if we put another two or perhaps three justices on, that's really what's going to be, ha that will happen. And that'll happen automatically. Another two or perhaps three justices. That was what Donald Trump said. Well, three is what he got. And those three could make the difference when the Supreme Court rules on this Mississippi case and the fate of reproductive freedom in this country. So starting us off to discuss tonight is Mark Joseph Stern. He covers the courts and the law for Slate and Kimberly Atkins store. She's a senior opinion writer for the Boston Globe and co-host of Sisters in Law, the Sisters in Law podcast, which is a great podcast, by the way. Mark, I want to start with you. Lay out for us the Mississippi abortion case and exactly what's at stake here. Yeah, so as you said, uh, this is a case about a Mississippi law that bans all abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, that is clearly a violation of Roe v. Wade, uh, which stated that a state cannot ban abortion before viability. 15 weeks is at least eight to 10 weeks uh, before viability, so it should uh, this law should fall. Uh, the issue is that we now have six very conservative justices uh, who seem to be gunning for Roe and who seem to be interested in rolling back or overturning Roe. That is likely why they took this case. Uh, 
and this case could be a vehicle for the court to roll back row and give states greater leeway to ban abortion but i want to make one note that i think is important if the supreme court upholds this ban this 15 week ban it may well abolish the entire framework for constitutional protections to abortion a race the viability line that has held firm for nearly 50 years and give other states the power to ban abortions far earlier in pregnancy not just 15 weeks but 12 8 6 even 0 so while we're talking about a 15 week ban really the whole fate of Roe v Wade is on the line with this case so I'm not being dramatic when I say that this could be the end of Roe you're not being dramatic you're being quite accurate Thank you. I just wanted to get that on tape because it's important to establish the parameters for those at home who may have heard the headlines but aren't exactly sure what this Texas case means or what this Mississippi case means. And I think that was helpful. Just say it in a straight up sentence. And Kimberly, is there any way for states or for the states or Congress to fight back against this? Is there anything that they can do? The answer is yes. Uh, a number of states uh, have passed or are considering uh, what are called Roe laws, which would basically codify the holding of Roe v. Wade, that women have uh, a privacy right, uh, that there, there should not be laws, there cannot be laws passed that limit access to abortion, uh, pre-viability, that there should not be laws that uh, prohibit exceptions for the health or life of the mother, even beyond viability. Um, and, and Congress could pass that, as well as state legislatures. Of course, we were seeing a lot of Republican-led state legislatures going in the exact opposite direction, which is how we got these Mississippi and Texas laws and resulting cases. There are some states that are pushing laws that go even further, as Mark said, uh, that define life at contraception that would ban all abortions ever. Um, so this is a crucial issue. And what you said, Zerlina, is really important. It's important to remember that a lot of re a, 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 an important aspect of this on the ground is that this will affect mostly black and brown people, poor people. There is a lot of talk about voters standing up and, and perhaps punishing the GOP for trying to, to do this, for in, in installing judges, not just at the U.S. Supreme Court, but at the lower courts uh, that are more con conservative. But keep in mind, even if you live in a state where these laws are being passed and you have the privilege of being able to travel, you have the wealth and, and status to be able to obtain abortions elsewhere, this doesn't feel as existential to you. This feels a lot more existential to poorer women uh, uh, women who have fewer opportunities, as you said, women, many of whom already have families and are trying to make good decisions about their lives, uh, who are being denied access, the ability to do that. So it's really a law that is designed, and, and the people who are passing these laws know that, they are designed to really target the most vulnerable in our nation. And they want you to think that every single abortion is, you know, some irresponsible woman who, I don't know what they picture in their mind, but, but they definitely do not picture a mother who already has three children and a husband, or even if she doesn't have a husband, three children already, and she's thinking about if she can afford the fourth. And I think that is an important thing to always keep in mind here. And Mark, one of the things I think people also need to understand is that depending on upon what the court decides, there's something called a trigger law. And there are a number, about two dozen states in the country that have these laws. What are they and what happens when the court decides, let's get away with Roe v. Wade, that is no longer the law of the land? What happens next? So a trigger law is a law that says, as soon as the Supreme Court overturns Roe, our state will ban abortion. Uh, and I believe about 11 states have an explicit trigger law uh, on the books right now. Uh, many more states have laws that are sort of lying in wait, that are being held off by court decisions, by the continued existence of Roe, that could spring back into action as soon as Roe is overturned. 
overturned. So there's this sense uh, among a lot of, I think, rather complacent uh, Americans that if Roe is gone, then there will be a big debate, that lots of legislatures will discuss this, that there will be a kind of slow rolling reaction. That is all wrong. This debate has already happened. Many of these laws have already been passed, and they are waiting for the Supreme Court to say the word to take effect. And so it's not that we'll wake up one day and a handful of states will start pursuing extreme abortion bans. It's that we'll wake up one day and nearly half the country will have banned abortion either before viability or potentially somewhere between zero and six weeks, as we've, as we've seen in Arkansas and Texas. So this is something that Republican legislators have been thinking about for almost 50 years. They have plotted every possibility. Uh, and once the court says Roe is gone, uh, all of these laws will spring to life and, and about half of the country's uh, women will suddenly realize they no longer have control over their reproductive systems. So that's a very scary thought, but I think it is the reality <laughs> that we're living in. So it's important to have the reality presented to you no matter how scary. And Kimberly, with that reality in mind, the federal options on the table, the, the House has passed the Women's Health Protection Act, but we all know how the Congress works, and we all know that in the Senate, I don't know what they're doing over there. So what, if anything, can the White House do on the executive level? Uh, and then what are the options to push for that Women's Health Protection Act to get through the Senate, if that's even possible? Yeah, it is very difficult right now. We do have a Senate that has that 50-50 split, but as we've seen before, there are moderate Democrats who will stand in the way, uh, potentially, of bills like this, not to mention the filibuster in which Republicans would uh, be able to stop anything from going through the Senate. Um, in terms of executive power, there it's limited. I mean, it's so long as Roe v. Wade remains the law of the land. We have seen Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, say that he will do everything that he can to ensure that that is enforced, and the Department of Justice uh, has filed a suit on the Texas law on that very basis. But because Texas has that vig vigilante uh, aspect to it, which allows private citizens to bring suit, it is unclear just how far the DOJ can go to uh, enforce Roe in this category, in this uh, circumstance, and that was by design by a Texas legislature. So it, it really would require action by the legislature, but as you clearly point out, that path is really unclear. It was really helpful to have both of you here tonight to help us understand what's at stake. Mark Joseph Stern and Kimberly Atkins store. Thank you both for being here. We'll have you back because there's a lot of other cases the Supreme Court is taking up this session that are also very scary. So we'll have you back for that analysis very, very soon. Please stay safe. Thank you so much. Coming up, the so-called Pandora Papers are exposing the financial secrets of the world's richest people. It's like my favorite TV show, Mr. Robot, in real life. We'll be right back. It shows us that there's one rule for the rich and then one rule for ordinary people. You've got a situation where the richest people on earth are paying lower taxes than a nurse or a cleaner. You know, it's completely unacceptable. And you think of the cost of all of the state interventions for COVID-19, the impact on the poorest people. We need that money. We can't have it tied up in dusty vaults in the Bahamas and these secret spaces. We need to liberate that cash, spend it on schools, spend it on hospitals. That was an official at Oxfam International reacting to what might be the biggest expose ever of how the rich and powerful hide their wealth. The investigation is called the Pandora Papers. It's based on nearly 12 million financial records that were obtained by a network of investigative journalists, including some from the Washington Post. And what they reveal are the ways in which very wealthy people allegedly shield their riches from taxes and accountability. As the Oxfam official said in that video, some of the world's richest people pay less in taxes than a nurse or a cleaner. And that really gets in my craw. That's just not fair. I don't like it. And it really hurts everyone. There is a lot in here, and NBC News has not yet reviewed these leaked documents. So we have not been able to verify their accuracy. 
But I want to bring in someone who has looked at these documents. Debbie Senziper is an investigative reporter for The Washington Post. The Post is one of the news outlets behind the Pandora Papers. And Debbie, this is incredible reporting. I mean, I joked before the break that this is the plot of Mr. Robot because that this is the plot of Mr. Robot, <laughs> um, in, in part. Um, but millions of documents, including details about a number of heads of state. If you were trying to sum up for our viewers what you and your colleagues discovered, how would you do that? I would tell you that it really is a parallel universe. It's a parallel universe um, that is being used, as you noted, by very wealthy, powerful people, by the world's millionaires and billionaires by more than 300 politicians, including heads of state, by fugitives, by murderers, by crooks, and by other people. And, and it really was eye-opening to see some of the names that popped up in this unprecedented release of financial documents. And we're hearing so much um, in these documents that is new. I think traditionally you might have heard like the Cayman Islands or parts of Europe or maybe in parts of the Caribbean where people are using some of those banking systems as tax shelters to avoid paying taxes. We've heard that story before. There's been plenty of movies about it. But South Dakota popped up as a hot spot and I never heard that before. Unpack that for us. Help us understand why is South Dakota a hot spot of this kind of activity? Yeah. It's the state you might least expect to be a global destination for the world's wealth, but it is. Um, and so are other places in the US, including Alaska, Nevada, New Hampshire. We like to say, and what we've learned from this investigation is, there is no more offshore. It's really onshore. It's in the United States. And what we found is in South Dakota, a number of people from outside the US who have been credibly accused of crimes, human rights abuses, labor exploitation, in some of the world's most vulnerable communities, moved their assets to South Dakota in recent years because South Dakota created very customer-friendly laws that allow people to park their assets in South Dakota with the guarantee of almost absolute secrecy. And so that's really lured or drawn so many people from all over the world, from all corners of the world. Um, and, and, and really, I would say South Dakota has become a go-to destination. It is an onshore tax haven. So one of the things I think is important for folks at home to understand is when we're talking about the richest people in America or the richest people in the world, we are not talking about lawyers. We are not talking about doctors. We're not talking about even CFOs. We're talking about billionaires. There's a difference between multimillionaires and billionaires and a lawyer who is doing well, but is not a billionaire. They're not Elon Musk. So can you help us understand what tax shelters they were using? Like, how did they work? And what, what do you mean by they were parking their money in South Dakota as a tax haven? What does that look like in practical terms? Yeah, the first thing I'd say is it's not illegal to move your money offshore. It's, it's only illegal when you do it to avoid paying taxes or when you do it to um, conceal the proceeds of criminal activity, which is money laundering. Um, but what we found is that a number of people from outside the U.S. were moving their assets into trusts in South Dakota. And a trust is basically a legal arrangement. So trust companies in South Dakota basically manage the assets of wealthy people. And those assets could be um, cash, money, it could be artwork, it could be property, it could be companies. And by, by parking their assets in South Dakota, they basically were, were that South Dakota enabled them to conceal those assets. And, you know, trusts are not just used to conceal assets from taxing authorities. Again, they're also used to conceal assets generated amid, amid accusations of fraud, bribery, corruption, human rights abuses. It's really, really helpful, and it reminds me of so many TV plots. It's like endless at this no. point. Um, one of the things I noticed, <laughs> It's funny. Um, one of the things I noticed is that there were some names missing. So here in the U.S., we have Jeff Bezos and we have Elon Musk. I didn't see them. Why is that? They didn't show up in our documents. We um, had more than 100 billionaires of the world's billionaires 
in these documents. In fact, the Washington Post has a story coming out this week that will name some of those billionaires. Uh, but we did not see some of the big names in the United States in these documents. You have to remember first that um, the documents, though there were 12 million of them, were just you know from 14 offshore providers around the world. So we only know what we know based on this group of documents. Uh, but yes, you're right. Bezos wasn't in there. Elon Musk wasn't in there. They just didn't appear in this in this cache of documents. But many other names did, including heads of state, people connected to Putin. Um, you know, many, many, many uh, pop stars, crooks, fugitives. A really interesting group of people. It was a really eclectic group, that was for sure. I never thought I'd saw like Tony Blair and the president of Azerbaijan on the same list, but here we are. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about this story as well is that Congress is actually debating whether to raise tax rates on wealthy individuals and corporations. Do you think some of this reporting may help those uh, senators and House members who want that passed? Do you think this may help them make that argument? And I feel like... This is definitely a place where we have a policy solution to this. We can we can regulate um, and, and make it so these people are not able to do this. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't know the answer to that question. I think the people that we spoke to, the financial crime experts, hope that one of the outcomes of this investigation are tougher laws so that, you know, the United States does not allow questionable people, bad actors from outside the United States to breach the American financial system. And I think the people that we spoke to want to see more oversight and tougher laws, much like you know we saw with big banks after 9-11, right? We don't want to allow terrorists, mm -hmm. drug traffickers, and others breach our system, financial system in the US. And the same would go, I think, toward the US trust industry which is a thriving industry in South Dakota and beyond, and it's really flown under the radar in recent years. So I think you might see a little bit of talk about that. That's really, really helpful to understand. It was great to have you here. Debbie Sensiber, thank you so much for being here, and I hope we can have you back if you get more documents, because I want to know what Jeff Bezos is doing. That's personally, I am invested in that. <laughs> thank you so much for being here tonight. So if you tried to log on to Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp today, you might have had some issues. Facebook's collection of apps went down all across the globe just before noon Eastern time. And they stayed down for hours. The social media giant's chief te technology officer blamed the outage on networking issues. But the timing is eh, it's a little interesting because Facebook has been a company engulfed in scandal lately. We've been covering it closely on this show for a while now. Last week, I spoke to Congressman Sean Caston of Illinois, who raised questions about Facebook's ethics for years now. They have built a business model where they make money by selling your data. They get your data by convincing you to engage on the site, and they know that the way you engage on the site is to provide the most incendiary content. Tell you to go attack the Capitol Hill, that will drive traffic. Tell you to take horse medicine, that will drive traffic. Congressman Kasten said that Facebook's algorithm combined with the tumultuous events of the last year created essentially a perfect storm. And that idea didn't just come out of thin air. In recent weeks, the Wall Street Journal published a six-part series based on leaked internal documents about the ways in which the company has prioritized its bottom line over the good of democracy. And the whistleblower who released those documents chose to remain anonymous until last night. The thing I saw at Facebook over and over again was there were conflicts of interest between what was good for the public and what was good for Facebook. And Facebook over and over again chose to optimize for its own interests, like making more money. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. As soon as the election was over, they turned them back off or they changed the settings back to what they were before to prioritize growth over safety. And that really feels like a betrayal of democracy to me. That was Frances Haugen. She worked as a product manager on the civic misinformation team at Facebook, a team that Facebook decided to dissolve after the 2020 presidential election. 
that has me thinking. Did Facebook think their responsibility to combat misinformation ended at the 2020 election? In a statement released after that 60 Minutes segment aired, a spokesperson for Facebook said in part, quote, we continue to make significant improvements to tackle the spread of misinformation and harmful content. To suggest we encourage bad content and do nothing is just not true. So that's the response from Facebook. How does Frances Haugen, Haugen feel about that reaction? Well, we might just find out when she testifies before the Senate tomorrow. And I know I'm going to get my popcorn for that. But joining me now to discuss is NBC News senior reporter Ben Collins, who has been following Facebook closely for years. And Ben, I am obsessed with this because I, I quit Facebook a long time ago. Like, I have an account, but I, I like, realized a long time ago that these apps were making me sad, and they were bad. <laughs> so lay out for us some of the main takeaways from that 16 Minutes interview. And in your view, what was the most damning allegation that this whistleblower made? Uh, it confirmed a lot of things that we've known for years. Uh, I, I guess the most damning thing is that it was all on paper inside of Facebook, right? Um, you know, we, we knew for years that they uh, did not really take uh, any sort of civic integrity seriously there. They would have these pop-up things for elections. They did it for the 2018 midterms. They did it for 2020. Uh, and then she confirmed that they were immediately dissolved after the election. You know, that doesn't really work out when there is a coup foment <laughs> inside of the government over the next two months. So that was the most jarring thing to me. And also, you know, she brought up these numbers about how uh, you know, 1% of violence and incitement posts were actually actioned upon by Facebook, taken down or, you know, or, or limited or something. It's a really small number, but also, you know, they were, violence and incitement was shortened to V and I. So, like, they have a whole, like, they have, you know, uh, lingo for this internally that the public does not know about. Um, you know, this is, there are huge problems internally at Facebook that they have never externally let the public know about. They've never let the dangers of this platform out into public. We've had to, for years, extract it through uh, sources inside the company and through our own data and research. But now we know this whole time that they were doing the same things themselves. I think what's scary about some of these revelations, and as you explained it there, is that they're aware of the risk and they are choosing to not do anything about it. I think that's the scariest piece of this. And when we watched those many months, or they were watching, in the months after the election in November, through the insurrection, they could see this. Can you help us understand that piece of this? How does this all fit in with what we saw um, between the election in November and the insurrection in January, and the role Facebook specifically pl played in fueling that? Well, it makes a lot of sense that that would uh, that you know they didn't take any action as per all of these whistleblowers' uh, complaints in the weeks before January sixth. That's what we saw. You know, I wrote a story on January fifth about all the all the chatter on not just places like 4chan, but you know, civilian parts of the internet, Twitter and Facebook, about people explicitly saying they were going to storm the Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Facebook didn't really do anything. It, it, after the fact, they do this. They they always do some sort of work after a disaster happens. Um, but they're fighting the last battle constantly. They're not really ever taking proactive action. That's how you see these, like anti-vaxxers are still actively on Facebook. They say they ban anti-vaxxers. They, right. They're not banned at all. They are currently in ivermectin groups, literally huffing hydrogen peroxide. That's what they're doing right now. I'm sure that, you know, the five hour gap there today where they weren't allowed to do it, where they weren't allowed to get what they believe is medical advice, I'm sure they're pretty nervous because you know th that's where they get their information in these spaces. Facebook has become a place where the wildest opinion thrives and it's stated as fact. So that's the worry here is that there's th that's never going to stop without any sort of, I would say at this point, regulation or legislation. You just said that they're huffing hydrogen peroxide, and I just, I don't really know how to process that information, so I'm going to move on to the next question because I don't have a follow-up to that. I don't know what to do with that information. That's as crazy as injecting bleach. I mean, I guess there's a spectrum of crazy. I, I, okay, we're focused. I want to pivot to another aspect of this conversation we're having about Facebook in this moment, which is Instagram and the effects on mental health.
of teenage girls. I mean, I'm an adult woman and I realize Instagram made me sad. What did we learn that was new about why um, Instagram um, is having this impact and what Facebook knows about the impact and why they're not choosing not to do anything about it? Yeah, we learned from these leaks that 40% uh, of people, 40% of teenagers have worse body image and they say it started on Instagram. Uh, makes a lot of sense if you've met someone who's been on Instagram a lot uh, mm -hmm. because everyone is presenting their perfect uh, lives out on vacation or on permanent vacation somehow. Uh, it, you know, Instagram rewards that sort of behavior and it makes everybody feel much worse. And they know this internally and they and they realize that this is this is a problem. Uh, Look, I, it, it's very difficult to stop that. Um, if Facebook will tell you that overtly, you know, they're saying like, this isn't misinformation, everyone's presenting their best selves, blah, blah, blah. But when you're presented with it, like a torrent of other people's better lives, it has real psychological impacts. And, uh, you know, the, the work done to stop that has just doesn't exist. You know, at, at the end of the day, I, I, I was thinking about this today because this website was down for about five hours and people fled to mm -hmm. Twitter and fled to my, you know, text messages. And everyone felt this like wave of relief. Everyone felt mm -hmm. like this, you know, something was off their back. Like we can just move on with our lives now. Maybe this is it. <laughs> and uh, that can't be good. You know, I, I, it can't be good that your product is making everyone feel like there is something attached to them. They don't want to attach to them. They're, you know, being weighed down by some sort of horrible backpack or something all the time. That's what Facebook okay. and Instagram is. That's their role in Americans' lives right now. I don't know how they counteract that, but they have a real serious problem going forward. I think that's really true. And I know that I joke that I quit Instagram because it made me sad, but I, that's ser That's true. I mean, I make a joke of it, but like, that's true. I was like, why do I feel sad? Nothing's happening. Maybe I'll delete this because I'm, I'm finding that I'm comparing myself to other people in their lives. And I'm like, why doesn't my house look like that? Why am I not wearing that outfit? I think as an adult, I can see that, but a teenager, they have, they have trouble with that. I want to sort of talk about the outage itself because as you said, this, today was the worst outage since 2008, which is significant. It was Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. WhatsApp, I think, is a little bit different just because of the way people who have family members abroad and friends abroad use that app. But is the timing weird? Like, how is Facebook explaining an outage for five hours on a day after a whistleblower told us all of their dirt? The timing is weird. I'm, I'm not going to pretend like it's not weird. Uh... Look, they had uh, DNS problems. This is very tactical, very complicated. But uh, you know, a very basic solution of, as to why it didn't get fixed faster is they couldn't get physically into the room in which they could fix it with the people they needed to fix it because of remote work. And also, uh, you know, getting into the conference rooms was difficult because badges were tied to the same system internally. So they literally, you know, everything everything failed at Facebook today. So they couldn't physically get into those spaces. That's why it took so long to get things moving and back up again. Uh, we still don't know if this was, you know, some somebody internally doing something funny, if this, uh, if they were trying to upgrade something, it didn't work out. We don't know if it was malicious yet. We just don't know. Uh, but the reason it took so long is because, you know, everything's tied into one big system and that one big system had a massive universal failure today. Am I gonna try to end the segment without making another Mr. Robot joke? I'm gonna try. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe they should look at the cybersecurity firm that works with Facebook. Maybe there's somebody there named Elliot. Uh, ben Collins, I really appreciate you being here and helping indulge all of my bad jokes and for helping us all understand what happened today. Because this is a really, really critical issue and important story that will have ramifications long beyond this afternoon. Thank you again. Coming up. The curious case of Kirsten Cinema. Will anyone be able to convince the Arizona senator to cooperate and try to get behind the Biden agenda? Remember, she's a Democrat too? It's a good question. We'll answer it when we're back. What do I want from this bill? I'll never tell. Because I didn't come to Congress to make friends. And so far, mission accomplished. <laughs> that was Cecily Strong on Saturday Night Live this weekend making fun of Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. And it's true, Sinema is not making any friends in Washington, except maybe among Republicans and corporate lobbyists. Sinema and another Democratic Senator, Joe Manchin, are currently standing in the way 
of the centerpiece of the Democratic president's agenda. Remember, they're Democrats, too. And President Biden has asked, was asked about that today. Why were you unable, Mr. President, to close the deal with members of your own party on key, par key parts of your legislative agenda last week? Thank you. I've been able to close the deal on 99% of my party. <laughs> two. Two people. It sounds like you're putting the blame squarely on two U.S. senators for your inability to close that deal, Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin. Am I incorrect? Is that who the blame lies with? Look, I need 50 votes. This isn't the first time Biden has publicly called out Cinnamon Manchin for standing in the way of his priorities. You would think they might be a little embarrassed at having the president from their own party call them out or for standing in the way of a bill that nearly all of the other Democrats in Congress want to pass. But no, like, I feel like a multi-trillion dollar social policy bill that would provide many things that Americans urgently want and need, like child care, paid family leave, and elder care, all things that Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin could get behind. But it appears that Cinema isn't embarrassed or worried that members of her own party are very frustrated with her right now. Actually, it's the opposite. On Saturday, she slammed the House, which is led by Democrats, for not passing the infrastructure bill on Friday. She was really serious with this. And that was very odd because Kristen Cinema didn't even bother to stay in Washington herself on Friday to negotiate a deal. Instead, she went back to Arizona for a doctor's appointment and a fundraiser at a high-end resort and spa. And joining us now is Amanda Becker. She is the Washington correspondent for the 19th. And Amanda, I know it is so easy to sit here and laugh at Cecily Tyson's great, <laughs> really terrific uh, Kirsten Cinema, um, but there are real and serious consequences for Democrats, but most importantly, for American families, if the policies that are in these two bills don't become law. There are, and we saw voters telling her that when Kirsten Sinema was, was back in Arizona this weekend. Um, she was confronted when she went to go teach her class at Arizona State University. Um, she was confronted at the airport, I believe, earlier today. So you do have groups of activists, a lot of young people, um, approaching the senator and telling them exactly what is at stake for them and their families. I mean, it feels to me like she needs to say what she wants at this point, right? And she she hasn't said what she actually is for in terms of what changes she wants to make in, in these bills, in terms of the social policy and some of the human infrastructure pieces. But reportedly, she has some concerns about raising taxes on corporations. Like, that's actually what she has shared with us. Why is that? Why, why is corporate lobby, corporate tax cuts her sticking point? I have been trying to figure out Senator Sinema's calculus since I wrote about her back in early May because I knew these negotiations would be coming. And she was already showing signs that she, you know, was not really willing to say where she stood on certain things. Like you said, the one thing she's weighed in on is the tax um, rate not going up on businesses and other tax proposals. And I think the real difference we're seeing in these negotiations is the other holdout, Sinema, Senator Joe Manchin, is talking to people about what he wants. He has even said like a top line dollar figure that he'd like to see. He has said things that aren't acceptable to him. He has asked that work requirements be put onto childcare and other things like that. And we are not hearing those details from Senator Sinema. And I think what we're seeing is that in the absence of her sharing those details, you know, providing voters with a peek through the window on what her bottom line is, people are gonna start coming into the house and asking because they're not really getting the information that they want from her. And she has said she doesn't wanna negotiate through the media, but at some point I do think in a negotiation you say where you stand. It's bad though if you haven't told the president. I mean, forget me, she doesn't have to tell me. She probably should tell Joe Biden though. Um, <laughs> in terms of the political calculation here, I sort of wanna dig in on that point because I'm a little obsessed with the math here. Uh, she is a senator not from West Virginia, like Joe Manchin. She is a senator from Arizona with rapidly changing demographics that we already saw have an impact in 2020. She's not up in 22, she's up in 24. But in terms of her prospects for re-election, wh who is she listening to? I mean, is, is the math of the demographics, you know, the fact that it just went blue in 2020, 
how does that play into what she's doing, like how she's behaving in this moment? She is making a bet on the fact that Arizona has traditionally been kind of a purple, purpley state that, you know, is independent. It's known for its independence. It's known for its mavericks like Senator John McCain. She is making a bet that the swing voters who put her over the finish line when she was elected a couple of years ago, she's making a bet that those are the ones that she needs to keep. I think what's less clear is if she's remembering that it's the activists, it's the it's the heart of the party, it's the young people, it's the immigration activists. They're the people who were out knocking on doors for her, you know, handing out leaflets and pamphlets. They're the type of people who flipped the second seat last year. So I think her reelection could look very different than when she was originally elected to the Senate. And she, in fact, already has a couple of groups talking about how they are going to fund primary campaigns against her if they don't see some more of what they want out of Kirsten Cinema. That's going to be a, a very interesting thing to watch unfold, the, the, the pushback on cinema from the left in the state of Arizona. And we'll see um, where this all shakes out. In terms of um, the social policy that are in these bills, the human infrastructure bill, Joe, uh, Joe Manchin has said that he wants to cut the bill down from that $3.5 trillion. Um, so we're now landing somewhere between $1.9 and $2.3. This is all giant numbers to people at home. It means absolutely nothing. What will they cut out? What does that mean in terms of what is being cut? What's on the list of things to cut? Well, that's what we're waiting to see. And a big decision will be, do they cut entire things or do they trim off a little across the board. So this bill has everything in it from either free or cheaper childcare, depending on your income level, to universal pre-K, to paid leave, to um, at-home caregiving, um, and things like that. So it, it really does run the gamut in terms of the, the topics that we're looking at here and the policies and the impact. And it remains to be seen as they kind of work through the details on this, whether they shave off a little bit across a lot of areas or whether whole mm -hmm. chunks of the package go in order to get under that price tag. That's really helpful to uh, help us understand this. Amanda Becker, thank you so much for being here tonight. And again, you know, these numbers, they mean something to people. That means you'll be able to afford or not afford childcare. That's what it means in practical terms. It's helpful to know that. Please be safe. Coming up, burning it all down. A sex abuse scandal is rocking women's soccer. And some of the sport's biggest stars are calling for major changes. We'll be right back. Right now, the National Women's Soccer League is in the middle of their own Me Too moment. Last week, the lid was blown right off of abuse allegations by players against one of the league's coaches. First reported by The Athletic, Paul Riley is accused of sexual co coercion as well as making inappropriate comments about players' weight and sexual orientation, with the allegations dating back more than a decade. Riley has denied all of the allegations against him. Immediately, though, current and former players like Alex Morgan jumped in to support. Morgan tweeted, bottom line, protect your players. Do the right thing. The reaction to the allegations by the league it has been swift. They released a statement saying a safe and secure work environment is a top priority. Riley was fired right away and the league commissioner resigned soon after. Over the weekend, U.S. Soccer announced they're hiring former acting attorney general Sally Yates to lead an independent investigation into the league's conduct. And if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because Yates provided key testimony in the Senate's investigation into Russian interference into the 2016 election. Still, a lot of the biggest names in women's soccer are rightfully pissed. World Cup legend Megan Rapino was on Twitter saying this, burn it all down, let all of their heads roll. <laughs> I mean, not to mince words. Joining me now is Kavitha Davidson, sports writer for The Athletic and Carrie Champion, host of Carrie and Jamel Won't Stick to Sports on Vice. She also co-hosted all of the Olympics coverage here on Peacock back in, uh, what is that, August? That went so fast. No. We just went through the Olympics. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. 
So, uh, Kavitha, I want to start with you. Two NWSL players shared Rubino's sentiment during exclusive interviews with NBC News, and I want to play a little bit of that, and I want to get, actually, I'll get both of your reactions on the other side. Let's just take a look at that. Do you think what happened with Paul Riley is an isolated incident? I definitely think it's systemic, and no one in a position of power that is supposed to protect us and to do the right thing has righted this ship. There are not new stories. They came forward in 2015 saying exactly what they did in that article. What are we saying to young players, 12 or 13 years old, about what we are going to allow to happen to our athletes in this country? And that's unforgivable. Kavitha, this reminds me a lot of what happened in USA Gymnastics in terms of the reckoning and, and the institutional failures. What's your sense of the frustration from the players right now as this reckoning comes around to women's soccer? I think there's so much frustration, particularly because the NWSL has been this kind of bastion of of women, of of what women can do, of the success of, of women's soccer players on the national level. Um, but the fact of the matter is, like so many leagues, this women's league that is a bastion of it has still like historically been run by men going into the season there was only one female owner um and that's a huge part of the problem here we there were no anti-sexual harassment laws on the books until this year um there are a lot of safeguards that just weren't in place and player safety has not been um has not been prioritized there weren't hr departments in a lot of these teams there were no there was no recourse for how to report without retaliation or that fear so i think that those frustrations are very real and very substantiated and Carrie, it's, it's a similar question to you in terms of the reaction and frustration of the players, but also can you speak to some of the systemic failures um, that those players were talking about? Because we've seen this in so many different institutions. Again, one of the similarities is like men are in charge of the whole thing and somehow no one considered what to do in the instance of sexual harassment. Like those two things, they go together a lot. Yeah, I, sadly, this is a story that doesn't surprise me. This is a league fighting to get money, right? To be paid equally. Um, most of these young ladies, and I know money isn't the issue, but most of these young ladies make maybe $30,000 a year and that's considered great. The reality is, is no one cares is because it's so brand new, right? This particular league is so brand new and they did not want any scandal because they thought if there was scandal, they couldn't progress and they couldn't go forward. And at the top of it, when you have the commissioner resign, it's disappointing to know that they went to a woman and asked for her help and she looked the other way. But that's so very common um, in our world, in our industry. And I think what they were trying to do is for the good of the league, put this under the, put this under the rug. Like, let's just not discuss it. Let's get to the point where it's okay. But the problem here is, is that the players, as mentioned before by Alex, are just the last priority. It's so, mm -hmm. can you imagine? The gymnasts are the last priority. The people who actually are giving and making all of the money are not protected. They are the last priority. And I don't wanna just blame it on the men. I wanna blame it on everybody who is in charge and who mm -hmm. has power. I'm very well, I am familiar with a system that will not protect you because they don't want any scandal. And there are women who you would think be on the front lines would protect you. There are those mm -hmm. that are in power or position you would think they would protect you, but they look the other way because they're worried about what the bottom line is. That's a very sobering but accurate, accurate point. And Kavitha, Sally Yates, uh, she was named as investigator and she is being brought in to look into this have you heard anything about how that investigation will be conducted and what she is trying to look for what what types of things uh, will come out of it potentially so there are several questions about what kinds of investigations need to take place first is the reopening of the uh investigation into paul riley that occurred in 2015 when he was the coach of the portland thorns um that investigation closed his contract was not renewed but then he was rehired as a coach in north carolina um what North Carolina knew about that investigation needs to come out. Uh, the commissioner that just resigned, uh, Lisa Baird, you know, she was not commissioner at the time 
Um, but what she knew uh, when when he moved over is also very important to find out. There were two commissioners in charge during uh, during Paul Riley's tenure here. I will say that Sally Yates, I think, is a very interesting choice for this. I think that we all have confidence in her being as dogged in this role as she was as assistant uh, acting assistant attorney general. Now, that being said, the NWSL has also hired to do their own investigation uh, Covington and Burling, which if you know you've been if you've been following the Philip Morris scandal from years ago or the NFL's, mm. uh, they were in charge of that. And they're kind of known for white collar defense. So the way that these two um, these two investigations play out is going to be really interesting to follow. Oh, yes, I, I am. a. I never practiced law because of law firms like Covington, Covington and Berlick. I did not work there, but I worked at a firm that was very similar and I never met a happy lawyer. Hundreds and hundreds of lawyers everywhere and never met a happy one. So here we are, doing living out the dream. Um, so Carrie, following the United States 2019 World Cup win, I think a lot of folks were like, soccer, finally in America, and women's pro soccer specifically, it can have a moment. Is, is this a setback? I mean, and how big of a setback could this potentially be, given the fact that it was just gaining traction here in the States? I don't think it's a setback. I think that it's unfortunate that we do look like, we do look at scandal if you are in a corporate uh, environment as, oh my God, we're taking a hit. But it would be nice to know, and this is for every single sport that, that and I'm gonna talk, speak specifically for women, because their sport, not only are they underpaid, they're not regarded. And this is an example, a classic example across all sports for women. If we talk basketball, we talk about gymnastics, we talk about soccer, this is happening day in and day out. And it's because people do not feel empowered. And it's only until they leave the industry or leave the game that they feel empowered to say something. And little do they know, we live in a world where transparency and authenticity at the end of the day, usually wins and it will reap rewards, whether they want to see profits or whether they want to see more people in the stands. If they're, you get behind a player that you support, like a Megan Rapino or a Alex Morgan, there are so many players that people support and they want to get behind them. And we can't support you if we know that quietly you're not protecting these women. So this is a perfect example to me about why women need to, they deserve equal pay. Another example as to why they need to feel like they can share in the rewards. The only female player that I know in sport, all of sport, and she still doesn't get the respect that she deserves, is Serena Williams, and she is bold. Now, mind you, she's taking a huge hit, but she is still paid and winning and loved. So you can say what you want, but authenticity, she's a perfect example of somebody who's going to buck the system and still win at the end of the day because her skill set and who she is always will outlast this big charade of being appropriate. Tennis, another sport. Let's be appropriate. Let's not talk about what's wrong. I don't get it. Right. I'm like, y'all... Right. I hate it here sometimes. I just do. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think more women just have to be themselves. Do not try to pretend to be something on Instagram that you are not in real life. Just put it down. Today was the day. This show is all connected. We're putting all the pieces together. We're going to end the show by saying stay off Instagram for a minute and try to be your authentic self as much as possible. That's just good advice for life and sport. Kavitha Davidson and Carrie Champion, thank you so much, both of you, for being here. It's always great to have you both. I love sports and the intersection of sports and gender, so this is my jam. Please stay safe. I want to end tonight on a little bit of good news, and here's something I thought I'd never say on TV. Let's talk about NASCAR. I don't know. They put it here for me. Bubba Wallace made a little history in Talladega today by becoming the first black driver to win a NASCAR Cup Series race since 1963. The race was shortened by rain, so he wasn't able to drive past the checkered flag like usual. Regardless, Wallace talked to NBC Sports about the significance of the win. I want to know what it means to you, the second African-American, first since Wendell Scott, to get to victory lane at this level. Yeah, I never... Uh... I never think about those things and when you when you say it like that it <laughs> it's obviously brings a lot of emotion a lot of joy to my family fans uh, friends it's pretty damn cool so just proud to be a winner in the cup series that is pretty damn cool if i if i say so myself and i'm not even a nascar fan and i want to say congratulations to bubba it's, it's dope that's dope
That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. The Medi Hassan Show is coming up after this short break right here on Peacock. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.